Hi, my name's Londe Yusuf. And my name is Reggie Williams. And we're the co-founders of Black Film Space. Black Film Space is a grassroots organization dedicated to enhancing the skill sets of black filmmakers and building a community of creatives. We host events such as screenwriting workshops, panels, mixers, and other events that are designed to support black content creators. In the next episode of the Black Film Space podcast, we interview Terrence Burke. Terrence is a cinematographer who has recently worked on Tyler Perry's The Oval and Sisters. We talk with Terrence about his experience working with Tyler Perry, his workflow process with his team, cameras, and much more. And now, on to our interview. All right, Terrence, thank you so much for joining us on the Black Film Space podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Of course, of course. You know I love your work. Um, first off, I just want to say congratulations on uh, the most recent work you've been getting, um, collaborating with Tyler Perry on uh, some of his new shows on BET. Just congratulations for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it very much. It's, uh, you know, it's uh, it's exciting, you know, this new uh, venture that Mr. Perry has with BET and Viacom, and I'm excited to be on board. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, like I said, I love your work, and, you know, I've, I've watched your reel many times, and I think it looks amazing. Um, I'm really curious to know when you started to notice your work improving. Um, you know, it's interesting. It's, um, I would have to say, you know, in, in grad school, when I went to uh, the American Film Institute, AFI, Mm -hmm. you know, before that, uh, I feel like I didn't really know anything, you know, before I went to, before I went to film school, but I noticed, you know, working, working with, uh, like-minded, you know, men and women at the school and the teachers were phenomenal. I feel like that's when I learned that uh, my work was getting better, mm. and uh, that was like the first the first time I started noticing, uh, you know, all all the learning and stuff that I've been doing all the all the years of, you know, working as a, as a as a grip. Because I was a grip for many years before I went to uh, AFI, but I feel like putting all of that stuff together, and as well as uh, the learning part and the, the shooting a lot of AFI because you do a lot of shooting mm. that I, I found my getting better then but um on a professional level i would say you know working with you know, and actually it's funny because when i came out of school first i wasn't uh, I, didn't, I wasn't working a lot as a dp you know so i was you know operating and stuff and, and you learn a lot when you're operating for other dps and stuff so you know um just learning what the you know the frame and learning about how you know, things are done on the other side. It was, it was a very, uh, it was a learning experience to, to work with different people and to see how they do things and so forth. And I implemented some of those, some of those, um, you know, the things that I, that I saw when I worked as an operator into what I do. But, um, but yeah, I think that, um, you know, for the most part, when you work with people, you respect and, you know, you're going to learn and pick up some things that's going to help you, you know, in the future. And then uh, I believe that's what happened with me. It's working with a lot of good people and putting putting myself in places where I could learn as much as possible until I get on my feet and, you know, and to the point where, um, you know, you can work on things, you know, while you're, um, while you're shooting and prep and so forth and, uh, you know, and just produce better images and learn to be the best DP you can. Mm-hmm. So what are, what are some of the adjustments that you made um, when you were at, at AFI or after your experience at AFI? Like, what are some of the technical adjustments that you made where you started to notice your work is better? Um, some of the adjustments, I believe, were were in lighting um, as well as using, using different lighting techniques, uh, different lights for different, you know, different um, scenes. You know, like there are times when, like, you know, tungsten light, you know, it just looks better than HMI light. You know, it feels better. It feels it feels more, you know, definitely warm, but it feels more, um, just feels more organic. It feels more um, real, you know. And uh, so just things like that. You're using tungsten lighting as opposed to HMI lighting and then just, like, 
you know, manipulating color temperatures to give you what you need, you know, in a, in a particular scene. Uh, if you want like a, if you want like a moonlight, deep moonlight look, you may change the color temperature a certain way. If you want it to be a warmer look coming from, coming from through the windows for day, you know, you would change that. So stuff like that, as well as, um, you know, and also, which is really important is, um, the framing of the camera, putting the camera in the right place, you know, because, um, you know, in the right lenses, putting the camera in certain places where you, where you get the best out of the, out of the story is all about the story. It's not about, you know, Oh, this looks fantastic. All the DPs are going to love this. You know, no, it's, to me, it's always about the story. So putting the camera in the right place for the story, the right lens, who's, who's, who's getting the most weight in the story. Mm. You know how much how much weight do you use in terms of the cam in terms of the lens for this person as opposed to the other person? Mm. Things like that that will make the make a world of difference in, um, in my cinematography and, and telling the story and so forth. So um, yeah, I would say like framing, lighting, as well as uh, lenses. You know, picking out the right the right focal length for for a particular emotional scene or or any scene that that is is telling you know telling the story and just making sure that you're giving the you're giving the way in the right direction for the person who's representing that particular um scene Mm. so yeah that's those are the those are the things that uh i learned a lot and um you know like it pulls like doing like a a longer lens on on one side of the person maybe a little bit it's a little bit tighter than the other person would be a little looser we're showing more the weight is going in this person or if it's like if they're a couple and a person is uh they're having you know issues in their marriage and maybe you know they're like he's to the left of frame and she's to the right showing discord and if they're if they're in unison if they're in sync then maybe they'll both be center punched you know showing showing that visually you know just mm-hmm. visually telling the story mm-hmm. things like that or somebody you know somebody's a jerk maybe they'll be a little bit darker in tone than the other person on the other side it's just a little bit enough as you can see you can tell the difference. So, yeah, telling the story in the lens and framing, those are things I learned. And, uh, yeah. What And what is the weight? You, you, re- you referenced that a few times. And in terms of, like, the um, the mood or who is um, who is carrying the scene, you know, like if we if we have a scene where there's a wife and, um, you know, she's she's caught her husband cheating. So she's the one who's, who's angry. She's the one who's very upset. She's the one who is the scene is about, it's about her anger. It's about her finding out. So we may have a tighter shot on, on her, you know, and maybe a looser shot on the guy. We're saying that the scene is about her. So that the weight she's carrying the weight of the scene, the emotional, mm-hmm. you know, it's about the emotional part of the scene, like what, like it's her important beat is in the scene is her. So we may make, we may make her, well, I want to visually show that she's important in the scene. So we do that either with the lighting, um, or with the, the framing, maybe she's long lens and he's a little bit wider where the background is totally out of focus on her. Maybe it's not on him. Just things like that. It's just put, put her in center, front center emotionally in, um, in that scene. Mm-hmm. That's the way. So you've been, you've been doing a lot of television work um, lately. What has your experience been like shooting for television? Well, I was shooting, I'm going to tell you about it. I was shooting with Tyler. It's, um, it's interesting because um, it's like nothing I've ever done before. He's a brilliant man and in the way that he does things. But um, we always shoot with three cameras. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, that in itself is uh, something that is uh, very interesting because usually it's uh, usually two cameras, you know, on TV, maybe movies and maybe one, maybe two. But we shoot with three cameras every day. Mm-hmm. That's that, and everything has to move super fast. TV, t- in general, TV is usually faster than than than, than a movie, you know, than shooting a movie. You know, the TV, the average, I mean, uh, nine, eight, nine pages in TV is is a is a is a long day. Mm-hmm. Is is like a very long day. Where in movies, it may be like two pages, three pages, you know. But with Tyler Perry, where we shoot, there are times we shoot over a hundred pages in one day. What? So we're, <laughs> what? Yeah. 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 We're How? shooting we're shooting super fast, man. We're you know, we usually have we have um prep time. We have like maybe like three weeks of prep. So each of the stages we we 
we light and prep the stages beforehand. Mm. And, and we were on board with the production designer and art director and, and the set dressers and everybody. We, we get everything set up for those three weeks and we, we prep and then we, uh, you know, we rig and we light. And then when we, we get ready to shoot, they'll come in and, um, you know, we have like an hour to, to, to prep and get things going. He'll come in and then he's ready to shoot. And most of the time, you know, we've changed our lighting. Most of the time we would, um, in the beginning, we would have like lighting, you know, lighting up above, you know, from the top. We'd have um, different lights, LED lights, like blanket lights, light mats in different areas of different sets. And then we'd light through the windows, like a transom light. And we'll have like sky panels and, and uh, 2K um uh, baby June, baby uh, DJs, tungsten lights. Mm. You know, if we want to have like a like a sunrise, sunset, or or night moon, moonlight, or, or or day daylight, we would um, we would do that with those lights. And then we have practicals, you know, for um, you know for the rooms and stuff. So yeah, we move super fast. We don't mm. we don't turn up. We have three cameras, one in the mid, one in the middle, two on either side. We go like wide, tight, dirty over. Boom, we should get the scene and we're gone. We go on to the next. And um, yeah, and that's the way it is. He wants to shoot fast. And, um, you know, we usually have like 12 hour days, 12, 13 hour days. We never really go over. Um, usually, if we do go over, it's probably like the last day of the shoot mm. where we may do a really long day, but most of the time it's 12, 13 hours. Mm. But yeah. So, yeah, so the TV, the TV world here that we do. Here in TPS, it's definitely like moving at a, at a, at a fast rate. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Mm-hmm. So, you, so they, you're basically doing one, one or two take, two takes max, right? Yeah, basically. Unless there's something technical that's happened with the cameras, or if anything, um, maybe with actors, whatever. But no more than than two takes. Yeah, and they usually nail it. You know, they definitely nail it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, when I first came, I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it, and then I. Saw- <laughs> I had a friend who was uh, shooting the show before me, Richard Violette, and um, I was coming in to uh, replace him for a, um, he was doing another job, so I was coming in to trail for like a couple of weeks, and then I'm, he's like, yeah, we shoot, you know, hundred you some pay? I'm like, get out of here. I don't believe it. And then like, yeah, at lunch, it was like six, 70, 60, 70 pages. Like, what? Like, oh my God, this is crazy. Wow. So yeah, but uh yeah, it was pretty. It's, it's pretty insane. It's definitely pretty insane. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, but yeah, but it keeps everybody on their toes. I mean, you know, we we light fast, we move around, and um, yeah, mm-hmm. that's how we do it. So you mentioned um, shooting dirty. Can you explain to the audience for those that may not know what does that mean? Oh, it's like it's being a, when you have a camera. And you have two people talking, and the camera is behind one person who you have the back of their head and shoulder, and you're looking on to the person they're talking to. Dirty is you get a piece of that person's head and maybe shoulder to to a certain side of the frame, and you get the other person's full face and maybe um, maybe their top shoulders. Dirty is having a person closest to the camera. It's back to you. Again, you're seeing a piece of them. That's dirty. Mm. Clean is you don't have anybody you know in front of you you don't have anybody who's back to your camera you just you just have a clean shot of the person's face who's facing the camera um Mm -hmm. so what being that you you all were shooting a hundred pages in a day what challenges did you all face or you specifically as a cinematographer the lighting may not be traditionally like um smart smart side lighting which is the camera if if there's a person in front of you in front of the camera and um, the camera is facing them. The lighting is coming from the opposite side of where the camera is. So if the camera's on the light, the light is, the light is going to be hitting the person from the left side. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to do to do smart side lighting because you have three cameras. That one camera that's going to be on the 50-50, which is seeing two of the people facing each other, they're going to be in the middle. You would see that light or lights over there to the other, to directly across the other side. You know, so that would be a, that would be a problem, not for the dirty ogres on either side, but mm-hmm. for for but for the A camera, which is in the middle, doing a fifty fifty of the, the two shot of the people, you would see that light. And also, it's that um, you know hanging hanging lights and having it in the right place 
is very important because, um, you know, things could change at a heartbeat. You may think that the action is going to happen here, but it may, it may happen in another, another place. It may actually be outside the door outside. So things change so quickly. It's like, it's, it, basically we have to have lighting, um, lighting different areas of the, um, of the, of the set and make sure that, oh, we can cut this on or bring this down or cut it off. We don't need this and that. So we're doing all that on the fly because we don't necessarily know a lot of times what the change may be or, oh, the person was in the living room in the school, but now he's going to be on the bed. So I'm communicating to my, um, to my, uh, my electrics and to the board op and say, Hey, let's turn on this light, blanket light above the bed. Let's bring that down to 20%, you know, or, you know, and I'll see it in my mind. Okay. Bring it down 10%. All right. Make it 3,200 Kelvin. Okay. Boom. Let's go that. Let's bring this light outside the window. Let's bring this down a little. You know, so it's in a practical lights is the amount of practical lights. So it's things you have to do on a fly mm-hmm. because it may change, it may change the job of that. So it's hard to do some on-site lighting when you don't necessarily know a lot of times where the talent is going to be. Where if we were on a job where we were lighting a certain way for a scene, just for these people, we knew ahead of time the people would be in this location. Then we could better light a certain way that'll be more of a contrast or more of a smart side lighting mm-hmm. for that particular for that particular scene, but. A lot of times you don't know. We're moving so fast <laughs> that it's not, it's not, you're not able to do like that, have that particular contrast. So there are times you have to bring, maybe bring the lighting down overall in, in the middle of the scene, keep them off of the walls and just, you know, make it as, um, as cinematic as possible for what you're, you're trying to do. And there's times where I think now we, um, we do, so I use them because of, we're using the Sony Venice right now, which is, uh, we just started using it like two shows ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, I love their camera. So we do it. It's very great. And, and, and low light, do ISOs, 800, 2500. So a lot of times where I'll do, um, I'll have the light coming through the window and have practicals and maybe a little bounce, bounce into uh, a ceiling or into B-board. And that's it. We're ready to go. Mm. You know, that's, that's what we're doing kind of like now. And, uh, you know, he's loving it and it's, it's looking good. Awesome. Awesome. And how would you d- describe Tyler Perry's directing style. Well, he's he's brilliant. He, uh, you know, he's he's been doing this for a long, long time. Movies, lots of movies, lots of TV shows, and um, you know, he's a he's a great communicator. Mm-hmm. You know, and he um, he's a type of person where he's really good with taking uh, ideas. And um, you know, actually, I just made a I just made a lookbook of um, of this new show we're supposed to be doing, and there was. I had images, I don't know, 60 images in there. And I sent it to him. And then uh, there's some stuff, A Handmaid's Tale and some other movies and TV shows. And he loved it. And he was like, great. And he started talking about lighting. And we started talking about, um, um, you know, time and lighting and stuff. And like, you know, it's great. You know, we, we bounce things off. He's like, hey, I like, I love a euphoria. Can we implement this? Nah, whatever. So, yeah, he's great. You know, he's great. And I say, hey, I saw Mandy. Check out Mandy. You know, so with, uh, with Nick Cage. So, yeah, and it's you know it's great to be able to like talk to him and to be able to have that open dialogue communication, and um, mm-hmm. you know, and as a director who's very much into the visual language of things, you know, it's really great. And um, you know, right now when we're when we're on set, he's really good at uh, you know with allowing me to to do the things that I need to do, but very quickly. Mm-hmm. And I say, hey, I need I need this, Mr. P. Can I do this? He goes, all right, great. Let's do it fast. I'm like, great. But it is go and make it, uh, make it happen or whatever. So yeah, he's very, um, you know, he's very understanding. And uh, when it comes to what the crew needs to do and how to do it, mm-hmm. and uh, he's very, he'll, I'm still coming to location. He'll be like, first time we worked together, it was three years ago, coming to the first location. He goes, okay, where's the best place for the, where would you want the actors to be? And I was like, oh, oh, great. I'd love to have him right here. <laughs> it was great. And they just, and that's what I want to hear all the time. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yeah. You know, he's definitely communicated and he's got, he's got a lot going on, a lot of stuff going on at all times, you know, writing and then uh, being a mogul. But, you know, he, he does take time to be able to, um, to talk about things and to, to bump, you know, pass along ideas to each other about different, um, movies he likes, different TV shows, different, different looks, different things. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, it's, and it's, and it's, great. it's, a, it's, a, um, you know, it's really good. You know, we have a, a film coming up. I'm a TV show coming up in uh, 
maybe like a couple of months, it was, uh, it was called Ruthless. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, he's like, it's, he's like, oh yeah, Handmaid's Tale, that's kind of reference I want, I want to kind of like go with. So I made a lookbook of like Handmaid's Tale, and then I made a lookbook of some other uh, different movies of different um, African-American people in them where there's a lot of shafts of light and there's a lot of like, um, you know, black men and women who are um, in, uh, in scenes that are like, you know, a little darker in tone, like Middle of Nowhere, Bradford Young, Mm-hmm. You know, and um, just different, different thing. And even like, I get in, I get into the spiritual side of um, of the, the things in my lookbook where I thought, well, well, this is what this feels like. This, you know, like these different photographs or different images. This is what I, this is what makes me feel a certain way in this scene or on this show. And you know, this will have this particular mood. And there's like a mood board with that, a different type type of mood, a dark mood or dark undertones and stuff. So yeah, so. Things that mix in what visually it could look like, you know, what black people look like in these particular environments day and night, mm-hmm. but also be like some spiritual stuff, like um, some paintings from like a, a famous painter or like uh, photographs, you know, like there's some photographs from um, Todd Hito that are very, um, you know, kind of like sultry and like, you know, a little dark and moody and stuff like that so yeah so there's i like to use a lot of those type of elements and uh, to to depict the mood and, and feel for what i think the script says he's very um understanding of of that and uh yeah we work well together oh dope dope so is is he also like hands-on with like the shot selections and like the colors and all that stuff or is he more of like a actor's director Oh no, he's hands on. He's he, he reminds me of Fincher. He's definitely like he's in the mode of like Fincher, mm-hmm. where he's um, where he's you know he goes, hey, I want to go, I want to go tighter, I want to do this. Like there's there's a, a walkie, and well, he's on he's on walkie. I'm on the headset, and he's communicating to to my operators as well. He's mm-hmm. saying, hey, go tighter on A, go a little bit looser on B. This and that, back up, you know, just do this walk and talk. Da, da, da. Yeah, so he's very vocal about um you know the uh, the lenses and where, where we're on and and the moving and back and forth of the of the, of the operators and how they how they move yeah totally oh, totally. totally were you operating one of the cameras oh no 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 i don't i don't operate the cameras i have three three operators they operate and i just i'm in a monitor basically um you know working the iris doing mm-hmm. iris control and then you know going more walkie pointing out to the movement headset pointing out to them you know, if they need to maybe tilt up or tilt down or give some headroom or, you know, like be mindful of, of this, you know, of this frame and da, 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 yeah. So, yeah, but definitely I'm, I'm controlling the image in terms of the iris and so forth after we, you know, once we get started shooting and stuff and rolling. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's dope. That's dope. Do, is there, do you have like a preference? Do you prefer working like that versus camera operating? In a, in a, in in a, in a, in a TV or movie situation where there's more than one camera, actually, you know, I shouldn't even say that because I, I do like to operate when I'm shooting. I do love to operate. I love to be closer to the actors. I love to have a relationship with the actors, but I feel like in movies and TV, there needs to be more of a, of a uh, onus on connecting with the director making sure the producers and everybody are, you know, are cool with everything you're doing, making sure that your relationship is, you know, that you're working with them, you know, that they're, you know, you're talking, you're collaborating, everything is networking, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's basically being able to, I love this. I, I, as an artist, I love to be on, on the camera. I love to be close to the actors. I love to, to feel the action and to be there. I love it. But as I'm going further and further, you know, forward, I need to be sitting with my director, you know, building, continue to, to build trust and build a relationship, making it stronger, talking about, you know, maybe even not even that scene or maybe the next scene or maybe talking about something in post. And I can't necessarily do that if I'm on the camera, you know, because there are times where you know, Tyler may say, hey, you know, like I remember watching a guy perform and then he was just doing amazing work. And we looked at each other like, this guy's amazing. This is, this is incredible or whatever. I'm going to talk about some other stuff. But I just think politically, it's really good to be off the camera, you know, mm-hmm. so you can you can hear if somebody, you know, 
wants to make a change in something or or if um you know or if the director is really happy about something or not but you guys are communicating all the time so it's just politically i think it's, it's, it's best to stay off the camera and then be closer to the director and uh building continue to build that relationship continue to to give them what they want because at the end of the day it's not about my lighting it's not about my cinematography it's about the story it's about me telling the story mm-hmm. so this director this is on the marquee i support like they say we, we taught a5 i serve the director mm-hmm. so anything the director needs me to do i serve them i don't you know this it's, it's it's their movie so they tell me to do something then i do it you know yeah. that's that's the way it is. So i think the better is i would love to always be off the camera and which is what i am when i'm italian i'm off the camera so mm-hmm. that's great what, what was the workflow process like when it came to lighting i get the script i read it and i sit down and meet with the production designer because the production designer is the first person hired on, on every job so they they have a, a plan of all the sets and um so i talk to the production designer so i see all the sets I see with along with the art with this with the uh, set dresser and the art director find out what color these sets are going to be find out where the furniture is going to be at we find out where where the windows are going to be at where the door is because I always want windows so I can you know motivate lighting from so production designer already knows I say hey I want I want a lot of windows you know he makes windows and then I say I want a lot of practicals so he tells the art director and then they they make sure there's a lot of practicals there. And then sometimes we talk about overhead, overhead lighting that they want to put in there. So, they, you know, they, they do so much to help out DP. Like production design is like invaluable. Mm-hmm. Production design, art director, invaluable because you can talk about the tone. Like I remember I was mentioning, this is very interesting. I had this discussion just yesterday. I mean, the other day and today. But um, I was talking to the art director about a particular room. He said, oh, yeah, this room. I want to make this room like this color. Black was like really dark. And black. I was like, yeah, I was like, you know, we haven't. Have we have you seen the skin tone of the of the actor? And they're like, no, no. I was like, well, I think we should hold off on that color. Let's get to, let's get let's go and see the cast. And they had they hadn't really finished casting it. So they, so we just they just finished casting, and I got stuff yesterday, and I was like, well, this person right here in this room, this is his house. He's dark skin, super dark. So maybe we should go away from this this you know this his house or room being you know super you know black whatever mm-hmm. so i was like great switched it to like a blue so it's things like that like collaborating communicating you know making sure that you know that the different uh the paint is maybe is going to be beneficial to to lighting you know um to make sure that there's practicals around um to make sure that there's like shears um that we can light through the window shears blinds and curtains mm-hmm. if we want to use if we want blinds to like create a certain pattern on the wall great if we don't raise the blinds up, use the shears to like take down the light, the hard light coming through, or maybe you open the shears, have hard light hitting across the bed or, or through the, or through the window of the kitchen and just put some haze in and have streaks of light. So just they're, they're, they're invaluable. The, 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 the art department production designer is valuable to, to a cinematographer and how do we light. And, um, and they're, they're, they're the people I'm talking to from the beginning mm. before I even start talking about lights. And what goes where and what? I'm talking to the production designer, I'm talking to the art director, I'm talking to the set dresser. Mm-hmm. Like, like it's the first first time I step into that to the to the studio, I'm talking to them, and they're extremely helpful, extremely helpful in every single way. Mm-hmm. You know? then, I'm, then I'm meeting the special effects guy. I told the special effects guy too, hey, we need a guy who's going to have haze. He's going to need to be on, he needs to be on set every time we have hard light coming through the window. He go do the haze, and the haze, boom, streams wait a couple, maybe uh, less than a minute. That stream of light comes through. All right, let's, let's roll. You know, so I'm talking to those people first before I start putting lighting. Before I start putting like a lighting plot together with my metric uh, team. So once I finish talking to them, then I, I work. I, get, uh, I, I um, gather my my key grip, my uh, uh, rigging key grip, electric gaffer, and best boy and rigging electric team. Mm-hmm. We walk around to different sets, you know, and say, hey, you know, so. Okay, for for daytime, I'm gonna have the practicals off. I'm gonna have this these lights, maybe two condors with two lights in each, banging through these windows, these big windows. We're gonna have shears to to soften it, and we're, we're gonna probably put some diffusion 
in the in the bucket for the two lights as well. Or we may put like um, depending on what type of day. If it's morning sunrise, I mean we'll put like something warm, and if it's nighttime, we'll do like a moonlight look. So we're talking about so I'll do that, and then um, maybe okay we need a light for a bathroom. Let's put this this um, light mat too well over the, uh, the shower, and oh the the art director says she's going to put a, a sconce over the top of the mirror. That might be enough. And then we need maybe another light, maybe like in the middle of the bathroom. And, you know, so we, we'll talk about it. We'll go around to different places. They'll make their, their notes. And I'll say, oh, maybe I'll put this, we'll have a light over the bed, or maybe not, because we have these two practicals on either side of the bed. We have we have this big window on the left side, so maybe we won't put a light up there. Maybe we'll just let this light come through, play moonlight we'll put for night, and then this other light the other way coming across the other way for day. Mm-hmm. So let's not put a light here. You know, and actually it happened today. Like I was looking again, I was like, you know what? I don't need a light over there. So I'm going to tell them tomorrow, like, let's take this light out. I'm going to use the practicals in the window. And if I need something extra, I'll just do a little bounce, you know, into a, into the ceiling, a little small bounce, dial it down, or maybe not even do it at all. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what, and yeah, we'll go around to each, each uh, set and we'll talk about what, what lighting we could, you know, we could do here and there. And I take, I definitely, I, I, I respect, you know, I start out as a grip. So I respect everybody in every department. So I take information, you know, if maybe I'm like, oh, maybe this light would be better. Great. Let's go with that. Mm-hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm all, I'm always like very inclusive when it comes to working with, working with the team and, you know, everybody's a part of the team. You know, mm-hmm. somebody has an idea that may be, uh, that may work and be great. You know, and it doesn't, and it doesn't, but yeah, but uh, I'm definitely, uh, I love the whole process. And then uh, we walk around, we walk around a few times. Like I've been walking around all week and then I've made a couple of changes depending on what they, while I'm walking around, they're painting a different place. And like, like I went in, oh, well, this paint, I, I mentioned this not, this shouldn't be green. And then, and then, um, so I went and walked back and it was like, it was still green. It was I mean, more stuff was painted green, like lime green. I was like, why is this lime green? And I found out there was a note from it very, that he liked particular colors for something say okay so i need to work around that green and so forth so it's all a team effort just making sure that we're on the same page so what you said you shot with the sony what what kind of camera is it this is sony venice venice yeah yeah sony the sony venice yeah okay and why did y'all shoot with this camera is it does that come from like the studio saying that is that tyler's decision is do you have an input in that? Uh, yeah, actually, it was interesting because um, before, I mean, he's been using a lot of the, um, the Sony F5s, F5 um, cameras, F55, actually. So we've been using that camera. He's been using that camera for years, and um, it's a 4K camera. And uh, so, yeah, that's been good. But then, you know, we're doing this, um, we decided to go, like full frame because we're doing like a lot of like video walls now, like video wall, um, you know, driving shots and so forth. Mm-hmm. So, so one of the uh, executive producers were like, "Hey, I really want to talk to you about these cameras. There's other cameras I want to try to get." And I was like, uh, "What is it?" And he was like, uh, uh, "I was like, is it the Venice?" And he's like, "Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly." So yeah, so he's like, "Yeah, I want to get the Venice." So yes, I'm said, Great, let's get it. So yeah, like uh, we primarily got this camera so that we can do, you know, have a lot of higher resolution for the video walls. So like we have a team that'll go out and, um, you know, wherever we're like in DC or Atlanta, and they'll go and shoot day and night stuff of like of um, different neighborhoods and stuff with a process trailer, uh, or a camera car, excuse me, with the camera car with a bunch of cameras around getting all the different angles. They'll shoot that, and then they take it take it to post, and then they'll they'll ingest it and transcode and everything. And then we'll and then we have a team that does the uh, video walls, and then they'll put the video put the images onto the video walls after it's color graded and everything. They'll um, or they'll do it themselves. We got this new team, so they can color grade and stuff as well. If we don't have, if our uh, colorists don't do it, but um, yeah, so they'll they'll put those those images on the video wall. And then, um, so yeah, put a car in place. We have a little monitor in front so they can see when the video will, when the, when the, when the images stop and start so that in the car, they can, you know, 
simulate stopping and starting. And then, yeah, and then um, and then they'll just do that. And then we'll have like a, just now they're putting up like a big rag and they're projecting the rag into it for the front windshield um, uh, reflection. And yeah, so anyway, so um, we got the Sony Venice for that. You know, for the uh, the video wall stuff, but also not not just that, but also because, you know, with these um, with the new um, deal we had with Viacom and BET, we want the images to be, you know, robust and and very like uh, beautiful and amazing, mm. and um, that's what we're getting. And then the the colors are fantastic. We can go dark, really, really, um, you know, dark in the um, in our images. And uh, and they still they still look amazing, and you know with the uh, with the dual ISOs, you know I I sometimes go to most most time I'm at twenty five hundred ISO, mm. you know, and then and use I can use like some light coming from outside a window, sky panel, uh, um, or a blanket light, and then I can use the practicals, and then that's it. Maybe a little maybe a little film, but maybe not, and that's it. You know the camera the camera produces amazing images you know, at low light with very little to no noise. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it's something that he's like, oh my God, I love, it. I remember the first time, first first scene, he was like, Taz, these, these cameras better look better than the, <laughs> the other cameras I use. Mm-hmm. Like, I spent a lot of money on them. And then like, yeah, he was like, oh my God, these are great, I love this. And he's like, this looks really, really good. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, but yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, and that's, that's what we're using right now. So uh, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty amazing stuff and it's um you know i think it's uh it's definitely making the images uh taking the images up a notch you know into the new uh into the new bunch of shows we got coming up mm. would you i i feel like it it has a glossy look when i watched the trailer for sisters and it, and it felt like it had a glossy look would you would you agree with that well i used um i had some filtration also using that, but also those. And what's interesting is that those trailers aren't necessarily they they don't have they're not the final look. Mm. You know, the the images. I mean, the the scenes, the the shows that we have now, the episodes, they have our final look on them. Okay, we have like oval is like is darker than it was before, mm. and sister is a little bit. I'd say a little bit more. Uh, textured a little bit more, um, um, maybe a little bit less saturated, but a little bit more um, crunched a little bit. So yeah, so there's there's definitely some difference differences in what the trailer is in now and um, and what we uh, what we have coming out soon, mm-hmm. coming out next week. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but that also there's I've, I've used um, I'm using um, I use filtration. On uh, sisters, we use a pearlescent, a quarter pearlescent uh, filtration filter for sisters, but it gives that uh, they really like a soft, uh, glowy highlight kind of look, mm. you know. And it looks really, really uh, looks really nice. I, look, I think it looks great on on all the women mm. and everybody in the show. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, everybody seeing it. Do you prep with the colorist as well? That's interesting. That's something that we're actually doing now. But what I what I have been doing, which actually what I've started doing with everybody here is uh, with with the lookbook that I created, I send it out to everybody. I send it out to Mr. Perry. I send it out to the production designer, the art director, both colorists. Uh, I've sent it out to to uh, G and E, of course, and uh, costume, mm. costume and and makeup, you know, so they can see what what it is that. Uh, you know, I took Mr. P's note on how he would like a show to look, and um, and I handed it to the to the lookbook in the mood board. So, you know, the visual references for what he wants it to look like, and then, um, I basically accentuated it and sent it out. So yeah, so then we can talk about because we actually it's interesting. Me and the colorist, we talk all the time. Like I'm down there every day. Mm-hmm. You know, during prep, I'm down there. I talk to them. I look at images, we, we, we shoot stuff back and forth. We, you know, we talk about, you know, different scenes. We look at certain scenes. We even make, you know, we, we both, we all like help each other out. We have two different colors and uh, I'm, I'm in both of their bays. 
like practically every day mm-hmm. looking at and so yeah so we've, we've been we've definitely we're really cool and um we definitely um been talking about the look for uh the new shows and so forth because we weren't able to before i think they, they came on board later on they didn't come on board before we were um before that um they didn't come on board before we shot and uh, i believe the colors we had before were in la but they they came and said a little bit for some other show but there um uh, it wasn't as much communication like these guys now these guys are in house so we talk basically every day and um mm-hmm. Um, and talk, and you know they really like the, the the visual references I sent, mm-hmm. and they're definitely on board with how how the look should be. But yeah, we talk about a lot of things, even you know maybe you know creating a uh, a lot of like um, of a film stock, maybe sixteen colored film stock, and we could use you know we could have it on the monitors and stuff, so I'm speak and see, and I can light light to that look mm-hmm. and make it look good. So. So there's, there's a lot of stuff that we're, that we're talking about communicating with, and that's great. I love collaborating with uh, with everyone, mm-hmm. with the colorist stuff. Good to be on the same page with them to the point where, like, I don't have to be in there as much because they know how the look should be and um, and so forth for the different shows that um, that is going on right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you said that some um, some of the colorists were, were there on set. What what's the benefit of having the colorist be on set? Yeah, they um, with these these new these two guys who um, who are on uh, up here now, um, Danny Clark and Chris Cobra. These guys are awesome. They they came they come to set and they can see they see what exactly we're doing, like what what's on the monitor, what. What is the image looking like? And we're talking and saying, "Hey, I'm saying, hey, um, well, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to do that. This is what I'm doing." So it, it's, it benefits having them on set so they can see how we're lighting things, what what we're looking at, talking to Mr. Perry, talking to me, and uh, and even the VFX the VFX guys. Sometimes they come to set and they they're they're our third eye. They say, "Hey, you know, watch out for this," or "Hey, watch out for that." So it's great having those guys come through. You know. Um, you know, every now and then, I would love them to come through even more. You know, so uh, they they be that be that extra eye, or say, hey, you know, like, you know, be mindful of this and mindful of that, or hey, um, you know, the VFX people, and then, you know, just basically having post around, it, it doesn't hurt. Yeah. You know, it, it saves money to have post around, you know, as opposed to not being around and then trying to like fix it in post, mm-hmm. which is what you hear kind of often. But if post is on set from time to time, then that helps you with not having to, to fix in a post mm. so much. What is a, what's your favorite camera to shoot on? Just generally speaking. This between, this, this between the, 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 the Lexa mini, you know, every mini uh, LF and, um, you know, and, uh, and the Sony, the Sony Venice. I mean, both cameras, both, both cameras produce amazing images and, uh, you know, Full frame camera, it just is amazing. Both cameras, I can't pick between the two. I love them both. <laughs> mm-hmm. The uh, I would say, I, I guess I should say so. Actually, I should say Sony because we have a bunch of Sony cameras for uh, TPS. But yeah, but like I really do love uh, both cameras. But uh, right now, what we have, the Sony Venice, is uh, is what is what I'm loving right now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, what would you say are some differences in be- uh, between working in Atlanta, New York, and LA? In New York, I don't get a lot of union DP work. Mm-hmm. I get a lot of union operating work, and I shoot a lot of independent work as a DP. But when it comes to, I guess when it comes to TV, kind of like in New York, the UPMs kind of run things. Mm-hmm. So the UPMs usually have their stable of DPs. They're usually, you know, they're not of anybody of color for the most part. So the UPMs usually have their, their they have their DPs and um, they round up. Well, if this guy's available to go with that or if this one is available to go with that. So that's how it usually kind of works in, in New York. And in, in Atlanta, it's funny, when being in Atlanta, like, I'm, all I'm doing is DPing um, union jobs. So that's been refreshing. It's just one of those things. I'm not sure if it's, I don't think it's anything necessarily racial or anything like that. 
I think maybe it's just the opportunity, you know, like um, getting the right opportunity and meeting with the right people, you know. And, um, you know, for many years, I mean, I'm from New York, so many years I, I was a grip technician in New York. So a lot of people see me as, they put me, you know, see me as grip, but hey, I, I paid my dues. I went to AFI. You know, I've been doing, you know, independent stuff for years. And, um, you know, I've been shooting. So, you know, I, I'm sure that my time is going to come into getting, you know, getting more and more union work out in New York as a DP. Mm-hmm. And, in, uh, and in L.A., you know, I've only done non-union stuff in L.A. I, I, I've only shot non-union stuff in L.A. I've never done any union stuff in L.A. But I just think because I haven't been, I haven't spent a lot of time in L.A. I haven't been in L.A. In, uh, since, 2014, 15, or whatever. Mm. But at a, at a t- I was getting a lot of non-union work in LA. But I, I think for me, I think what what it is is just um, because right now I don't, I'm not represented. I don't have an agent right now. Mm. But I think once that I do have an, an agent, and I think that um, it's going to be completely different. Then. I think there'll be um, it'd be more of an opening for me to get work in LA and in uh, New York through the agency. So. Mm. You know, I think that's part of it too, you know, and, um, you know, eventually that's going to happen. So it's not anything that, that I'm really worried about or anything, but I'm enjoying the time here and opportunities that I have here. But definitely, I think once you have, it's funny because I was talking to an uh, agent a couple of weeks ago and, um, you know, they're kind of looking at possibly, you know, signing me or whatever. So one of the things that we were talking about is about, um, uh, Oh, if I was coming back to New York, there's a lot of work in New York. They have they have uh, clients who are working out in New York now and so forth, even in L.A. So I, I just think it's just, it's just the opportunities and it's that, you know, the agencies putting, you know, being able to, um, you know, put you in uh, in certain places to succeed and to meeting with the right people. So, you know, hopefully uh, that'll happen soon and uh, sooner than later. But, yeah, but mm-hmm. I'm enjoying being in Atlanta. And uh, working as much as possible, so mm-hmm. it's, it's great. Yeah, it's dope. <laughs> Not that, complaining. It's it's dope that you've been able to get the amount of work um, that you've gotten without an agent. So it's only gonna, you know, expand once once you hit that that goal or that mark. Yeah, I think it, what, it's interesting. It's interesting because um, I've done you know I've done a lot of things, but I think what it is is that agents they want. I think agencies they want to smell the money. So, I mean, I know I know guys who shot one thing that's going to Sundance and they got an agent. Actually, mm-hmm. I know a couple of people like that. So it's just basically, I to me, if you're getting if you get into a major uh festival and then um the agents just flock to you. And I was looking at a pod show and a, a a podcast uh, a couple of days ago with um a cinematography podcast. And one of the DPs, I think, was uh, Ellen Curis. And she had said her first feature that she did. And she really, she said that, um, you know, she was, you know, getting a fee wet or whatever. But the first, very first feature she did, kind of like the very first job, it went to Sundance. She won the cinematography award and agents went, you know, mm-hmm. they were going nuts. Mm-hmm. You know? That was years ago when Sundance was kind of starting out. But it still holds true now. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, and I'm... I know some people, like I said, who just who just signed to major agencies from huge and the, the films that have done huge at, at the biggest festivals. Mm-hmm. So um, I have, I mean, I've I've had work that's been in a lot of festivals, just not the biggest festivals. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's, well, that's part of it, you know. Not you know, so they they don't even, they may not even know who, who I am. Mm-hmm. But once you get to like one of the you know, once you get into like one of those top festivals and stuff, you know, for your you know for um you know, for the work you've done on a, on a particular project, then I think that opens eyes and then they want to sign you and they're like, Oh, I can, I want to sign this guy. I want to sign this woman. So, forth. so, yeah. but, but, but it's like me, it's like, right. And I, I'm just enjoying being down here and different projects that come up, you know, I'm, I'm loving the scripts that, uh, that I'm seeing, uh, you know, if it makes it to a certain big festival, that's great. Uh, if I'm connecting with my director, that's even better, mm. you know. That's if we're, you know, if we're connecting and I'm working on 
that film and the next film and we're building and building together. That's great, mm. you know, because, you know, that's what it's really all about. It's like working with good people. And Brad, that's funny, Bradford Young said it. He said he wants to break bread with directors. He doesn't want to just shoot that movie and then just, you know, don't see each other, yes. talk to each other. They don't want to like family, you know, like, you know, and it's, and it's true. I mean, you spend a lot of time. I mean, I've spent time with directors and stuff and, uh, you know, you want it to be kind of a community and you want to like, uh, you, you share a lot, you know, about different things and, uh, you know, about the script and maybe certain life experiences with the script and so forth you have and you share and you, you go out to eat and you drink and you talk and laugh and, you know, and then uh, that's important. That's building, you know, and, and I love that. You know, when I, when I was in LA, I would, you know, me and the director, we would like, uh, we go to movies and say, hey, well, I want to know movies you like, what directors you like, we'll see their movie. And like, we go to the Getty, hey, you want to go to Getty Museum, let's go. Like, let's see, I want to know what, what artists you like, what painters you like, what colors you like, what colors you don't like, you know, and then we, you know, go out to eat. So it's like, you know, you get a chance to really, really get to know the person when you're doing, when you're doing all that stuff and you're, 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 um, it's not like, it's not an interview. It's really just more about just bonding and creating that trust between each other. Yeah. You know, and, uh, so that's what I love to do. I love that part, just connecting, you know, with that person and just building, you know, and just having that bond, you know, that's what it's about. And then, you know, with that, the, the, the little job you do with them, the next job you do with them may be a bigger job. Mm. You know what I mean? And, you know, so that's the thing I think is, um, it's important, you know, so it's important for me right now. And, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to, um, to more of that stuff mm. for sure. What what uh besides the camera? What's your favorite tool when working as a cinematographer? There's this thing called the cloud, and um, we have two of them. They're like twenty by twenty, mm. right? And basically, it's beautiful because what it does, what basically you have, you have four grips who are trained to maneuver the cloud. So picture there's a, there's a huge field. And there's the action in the middle. Now, they bring the cloud in, and it basically it covers the the sun. Like basically, the sunlight that's hitting the top of the people, it covers it. Wow. And there's different kinds of diffusion that that they put on it. I think there's like a light grid. I think there's a light grid that I use on it. So it is like a light grid, and it basically it basically shadows the area. Now that's amazing, as long as it's not you know, windy or whatever, but the, the, the cloud works fantastic. Mm. The flip side, and what's great about it is that at night, you can use it as a bounce. So what we do sometimes at night is that we, instead of it being flat or at a, or at a um, flat over the top of the action, we'll have the cloud like standing straight up in the air and then use it as a bounce. We'll put like a muslin over it and use it as a bounce, bounce like a M18 light or M90 light into a two into it, you know, and then that'll create like a night look, like a, a moonlight, moon, moonlight, moonlight look is what we usually do with it at night. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's an amazing tool. Like I said, daytime, you can use it for overhead if you don't have a fly swatter, which is, um, a, a frame with a with a with a diffusion on it that's on a condor that's way up in the air. I love those, but if you don't have those, we we have the cloud. Mm -hmm. So I, I act overhead for for day, and and at nighttime, it can be a bounce. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, like a a nice moonlight bounce. Yeah, actually, I, yeah, it's it's funny. It's um, it's 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 the thing that I love to use because we actually have two of them, so we can gang them together if we want for overhead and it's like a 40 by 40 something mm -hmm. like that and then but we never did that we always just use one but um yeah you use those all the time for daytime stuff you know if it's really super sunny and all i was standing by if it's real overcast and the sun pops out but i use that and then at nighttime just stand it up put like i guess muslin on on the front and then we bounce bounce a light or two into it and you know and it has a lot of spread a lot of spread. you can you can raise it up you raise it up in the air. The, the, the four guys actually release it and, and raise it up in the air. Maybe about it can be as high as maybe twenty feet. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't go that high, 
but mm-hmm. you can go high and you can like bounce you can you can bounce light into it and it'll spread like so far so um yeah I, that's one of the things that i've uh, started using the past uh shoot the past three years i've been mm-hmm. using that that's dope that's wow dope. yeah so um it's pretty cool who who are some of your favorite cinematographers Roger Deakins is one of my favorites. Rodrigo Prieto worked with him on uh, 25th Hour with Spike. He's one of my favorite. I love his diversity. He's, he's very diverse in the stuff. I mean, 8 Mile is amazing. 25th Hour is amazing. Um, the movie with um, the Beautiful is amazing. Um, the movie with, um, with all the Scorsese movies that he shot are amazing. You know, Rodrigo's fantastic. Um, Matthew Libatique, I worked with Matt and Maddie a lot. Love Maddie's work, very diverse. The way that he um, he can do, you know, uh, Iron Man, Cowboys and Aliens, and then do Inside Man, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know. So Maddie, Maddie's amazing, and um, Rod- I mean, um, uh, Emmanuel Lubisky, you know, oh, with yeah. all the movies he's no, he's amazing. He's amazing. Yeah, with the things he the the the, the movies he shot with um, the movies he the, the the stuff he's done with Natural Light. Where for Terrence Malick's movies are, are, are incredible. He's got, I think, three Oscars, three or four Oscars. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, yeah, and then last, I got to mention my, my boy, um, Bradford Young. Mm-hmm. Bradford Young is, you know, he's amazing. You know, I love Arrival. I love Selma. I love Middle of Nowhere. You know, I love, um, you know, um, uh, um, God, what's that one? I read? Uh, Mother of George. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's amazing films. And, um, you know, the way just his style is, is so, I mean, it's beautiful. I love the, you know, he's not afraid of the dark. He's not afraid of just going with practicals. You know, he's, you know, he's, um, you know, he's definitely a guy who I, who I, who I follow and I, and I love the way, every time his movie comes, I always watch it. He's, he's I, I actually happens to be a very, like, cool person. And I like to listen to, uh, to him in these different uh, interviews he has. He talks a lot about connecting with the director and, and, and being and that's and that's and that's that's great because a lot of people I don't hear a lot of people say that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, I heard Matt, heard Maddie say it before. You know, and um, I think I've heard Rodrigo mention it before in the different uh, interviews, and cinematography uh, roundtables. But um, yeah, those guys to me, I love all those guys. You know, I love all those guys' work, and um, you know, hopefully, you know, <laughs> one day uh, I could be up in that. Um, in that realm, but you know, it's funny. I think a lot. I think a little bit of what each person, what I've seen each person do. And it's funny. Back then, I didn't want to shoot. I didn't think about shooting when I was working with these guys. But, but I do remember working with them. I do remember like, wow, Diggy, this guy stood out to me early on. Especially Roger he stood out like, wow, like you know, the, the stuff that he's doing and the, and the way he's doing it is like, it's incredible. So, mm-hmm. yeah, there, there is a lot to learn, and. um and every day, every day is a learning experience. Every day is a new camera. Every day is a new light. Every day is something new. So that's one of the things I love about being a DP is that you always learn every day um, about about something new, mm. you know. And and even as ways that you can handle things, different things. But I've learned like one of the things I've learned is very it's helped me out a lot is to be very very patient and to be very very uh, when things are going crazy around you. To, to, to not to not even get you know just to just blow it off or not not to even like you know not to get crazy. I remember one I remember a couple well, a month ago a couple months ago Mr. Perry sent me a text about like he loves working with me because um I don't get crazy when shit is like going crazy mm-hmm. I don't get crazy mm-hmm. enough. I think that's important. It's important not to to know that somebody's calm and cool and like okay it's coming the lights coming or this this camera of the battery's coming you know we get a change in cards. You know, the car just went out. We changed the cars. We'll be, we'll, we're going to be up in, in a couple of minutes. Mm-hmm. You know, just to just to not be crazy with things and just to know that, you know, when time is when time is short, you know, you got to finish by this time, whatever. It's like just to be, you know, a cool head is always is always good on set because sometimes people are going, you know, we're going super fast and people are like, you know, people are a little in a frenzied uh, state. Mm-hmm. And um, it's just always good to keep a cool head. You know, because people respect that. People are like, wow, if he's not stressed out, I shouldn't be stressed out. All right. Thank you so much, Terrence, for joining us on the Black Film Space podcast. Appreciate your insight and your stories and, and tips. Thanks, Reg. I appreciate it, man. I, 
I enjoyed, uh, you know, I enjoyed talking with you. And, um, yeah, I hope we can do it again. Of course, of course. Um, so is there anything else that you can share with us in regards to projects you're working on? I just want to mention about how important it is to, um, you know, this is Black Film Space, so this is important to be able to continue to um, bring our own, you know, people into the business mm. and to bring it, bring, and then also not only that, but bringing, you know, bringing, bringing, bringing them up through the ranks, you know, as, as, as leaders of the department, you know, it's very important, not just as a, you know, as a uh, parking person, as a PA, as an intern, you know, as a minority hire, no, but as a gaffer, key grip, camera op, DP, producer, executive producer, you know, it's AD, first AD, mm-hmm. camera op. It's, you know, it's very important for us to be able to um, to continue to to grow our ranks, men, women, whatever. You know, it's very important. And uh, I would say just for people out there just to continue to do so, continue to, to take chances on, on people who you know can do the job, who will do the job, and who have fun and enjoy doing it. Mm. It's very important because, you know, we we have to be we have to be able to help each other. Because if we don't if we don't take the time to help each other, how can we expect anybody else to? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Um so where can people find you online on social media or your website? Yeah, my, my website is um w TerrenceLeronBurke.com mm-hmm. and also I'm on Facebook Terrence Leron Burke and I'm on Instagram uh, yeah, Terrence Leron Burke <laughs> <laughs> Alright, thank you so much Terrence Thanks Reg, I appreciate it man Thank you so much, uh, I enjoyed this and uh, look forward to doing it again Awesome, have a good one Thanks for listening to the Black Film Space Podcast. If you're interested in being part of our community and attending events, please visit us at blackfilmspace.com and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Black Film Space. Subscribe to our email list and podcast. All right, see you soon.